Good morning, this is Tim Selden and Kathy Leach, the Monastery Foundation and International Monastery Council. This is the weekly webinar series, um, what that we call the uh, Monastery Foundation's Global Classroom. These are talks, generally speaking, aimed at either highly experienced monastery educators uh, or the leaders of monastery schools. This particular week, our topic is helping parents to hear the Montessori message. As we know, many of us try all sorts of things to have parents understand what we're trying to say and to appreciate it. Um, and the questions that come up, how can we convince parents that Montessori works? How can we convince them to enroll? How can we convince them to stay? And I added a, a side question, should we even try? Now, by saying that, I don't mean that we don't care whether or not they leave us or not. We care a lot. And I don't mean to suggest that we can essentially take a blase attitude about whether or not people are going to enroll in our schools. Because clearly, whether you're public, whether you're charter, or whether you're independent, you care. Without children, you don't have a school. But rather, the question is, how can we convince parents the Montessori works, or should we even try? One of the most basic things that we teach is that anyone who has enough money can afford beautiful buildings, but that's not in itself what makes a great school. It helps. The more attractive your building is, the more attractive your facility, the better the neighborhood it's located in. These are obviously issues that make any school more attractive, both to prospective parents that tend to keep parents with you and that tend to make it easier to attract new teachers to want to work at your school. A school that has gorgeous facilities has a real plus, but a school is much more than those facilities. It's the people. I think you agree with me because it's the relationship between us and those children, the relationship between teachers and their assistants or their co-teachers, the relationships of the teachers from one classroom to another, the relationship of the teachers with the heads of school and the administration and the board, all of those kinds of relationships. And most importantly, of course, because they're the ones who actually make the decision to enroll or to stay, the relationship between all of us and the parents, those are the things that make a school work. A great school is made up of people who share common vision and common values, who understand and support the school's unique mission. Don't tell me you're a Montessori school, because that's not good enough. There's a lot of different ways to be a Montessori school. And finally, a great school is made up of people who share a real commitment to each other as people, as individual people, and to the school as an institution. Now, many parents come to our schools and they come and go. And what they're doing is they're meeting a family need until, as they would typically put it, their child is ready for a real school. This is what we call the heartbreak of Montessori. When they leave us after we put years of work into their children, we've loved them, we've loved their children, we've appreciated everything they've done, and they walk out as if we were never that important in their lives. Now, sometimes parents leave in anger, but more typically they don't. They leave really saying nice things about us, but they leave. And I don't care whether they give us the spiel about it's not you, it's me, or they more typically say it's money. I can't afford it. Um, what they really mean is sometimes they can't. More typically, it's that they're frankly not wanting to keep doing it because money is not unlimited and they'd rather spend that money on something else, whether it's a trip to Hawaii or to put aside for college or whatever. They want to make their lives easier by dropping out the cost of tuition as quickly as they can. Our goal as schools is to try to find people who are going to stick with us through thick and thin, even though it's a burden who want that education more than they want that money. It doesn't mean they can do and afford what they cannot afford and that they do what they cannot do. But rather, I'm suggesting we want parents who really value us, really want to be with us badly. So the question of today's talk 
is how can we convince parents that Montessori works and that they should enroll or that they should stay? Kathy, want to jump? Jump in here? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things you said, Tim, uh, I've reflected on quite a bit over the years, and one of them is that parents say that there's no money for this. Um, or, you know, more likely, um, particularly for schools who have more than early childhood, if you have a child from infant toddler age through uh, upper elementary, middle school, or high school, we're talking about sustaining those those tuition payments over, you know, sometimes 15 years. That's a long time. What do we do about people who just frankly get tired of that payment and start thinking, well, it's now become acceptable to move. Where before, and particularly I find the younger the child is, the more unacceptable it is for, for parents to consider a move. The older they get, the more they get involved in other things. Parents start thinking, well, it would be okay. They would adjust and we could not have to have these payments. Um, so I think there's a little bit of maybe tuition fatigue, if you will, over a period of time. The other thing I see is that it's not just about the dollar amount. We can all, you know, say what our tuitions are and, you know, high, low. It's, it's really about the, the perceived value that the family is receiving. So if at any point in time they start thinking it's, quote, unquote, not worth it, you have a huge potential loss. And so how do we continue, and this is part of the discussion, I don't have all the answers, but how do we continue to make sure that we are continuing to provide programs that parents perceive as worth it? So the worth itness and the tuition fatigue, I think, are two of the big players in the financial aspect of, of, uh, of retaining parents. Absolutely. I want to apologize, speaking of not being able to see. Uh, Deborah just pointed out that you could not see my slideshow that I was scrolling through, and that's because I forgot to share my screen. So what, what is it they told us in training? Always always know your materials. Have the environment prepared. Well, sorry, folks. I, uh, I forgot to turn on screen <laughs> sharing. So I'll just quickly scroll through to where we were. So the title is, of course, Helping Parents to Hear the Monastery Message. The question that we asked is, how can we convince parents that Montessori works, or should we even be trying? We'll get to that question in a few minutes. I pointed out that schools are really made up of the people and the relationships between people, that great schools, really great schools, whether Montessori schools, Catholic schools, whatever, they're made up of a community of people who share common values, have a common vision, understand the school's mission and support it, really feel a strong commitment both to each other as parents, as teachers, as human beings, and to the school as an institution that's important in their lives. And then I pointed out that many parents come and go using the school to solve a problem so that they can go to work, they can have Pilates classes, play golf, whatever, Parents come to us for all sorts of reasons, but quite often for them, it's a great place until their child is ready for real school, which is heartbreaking to all of us in the Montessori community. Teachers and sometimes um, teachers sometimes see parents as allies. Sometimes they see them as tormentors. And quite often I hear them describe parents as an obstacle to normalizing their students. They often say things like, it would be so great if kids didn't come with parents. But the reality is they do. Uh, parents are wonderful people, but they can sometimes be frustrating to teachers. Kathy, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I kind of you know, smirk a little bit about that parents can be frustrating for teachers until we remember who pays the tuition <laughs> and pays the payroll. Um, it, it's a it's a pet peeve of mine to be honest with you, Tim. That um, that teachers will blame parents for the difficulties they have in the classroom with the child. There's no follow through at home, or they bring the child late, or you know don't pack the right food. Whatever the things are, first and foremost, the parent has the right to parent. Period. It's their child, and we don't have to like it. So let's work with the families that we have. We believe that there's some kind of aligned vision and value or they wouldn't be at our school. 
And just as we start with children, we'll start where they are. We want to start with parents and families. Start where they are. You can certainly bring a parent much further along through kindness and mentoring and coaching than you ever will through judgment. So I think it's a, just an exceptionally important piece. And, and parents, you know, this is not a marketing thing, but parents usually buy into a school because of the head of school or the admissions director or who, whomever they've connected with through those first couple of contacts and school tours and learning about this vision. That's the reason they choose our schools. But they stay at our schools because of their relationship with teachers and because they believe that the teachers care about their children, know their children, and educate them well. And if, if the teachers don't realize they're an integral part of the retention of families, then we as, as administrators are missing the boat on how we can mentor our teachers. That's a good point. So I don't know if, if any of you have ever had that experience out there. We'd love to hear from you if, if you uh, have and you want to share anything. But the ain't it awful phenomena, whether it's in the heads of schools mm -hmm. who say, I can't get my parents to cooperate. I can't get my parents to appreciate. I can't get my parents to pick their kids up on time. I can't go, you know, pay their bills on time. Whatever it is, there is an underlying thought, which is that these are real people. They're not wet clay and they cannot be molded. They are real people. And part of the message of the Monastery Foundation for all of these decades has been, you can't change people. Mm -hmm. At least not in a way that really gets to their core values. People have attitudes about the way kids ought to be treated. They have attitudes about the way they feel about parents who are different from them. A lot of parents, really appreciate teachers and are so kind, but they may not like administrators. They may think they're rather evil and would rather avoid you. Or they may feel that you're their, their father and mother confessor, that they want to tell you all the problems in their marriage. Um, they may like one teacher more than another. They may not like Montessori. They may like the school because they'll be loyal to any school where their children are, in part because they want you to treat their kids kindly. So they'll, there's almost an exchange. Um, you know, I'll do this for you if you take care of my kid. And a lot of parents will put investments, if you will, into an emotional bank account mm -hmm. with teachers, with presents and kind words and so forth in fear that one day their kid will bite another kid or do something obnoxious <laughs> and they don't want their kid blamed. They want to be shamed as parents. Exactly. And it's interesting that their core values that they come in, we're not going to change that. We understand that. We're not going to change their worldview, nor is it our goal. However, this, this view that they come in with, and particularly when I see a parent of a toddler or, or an early three-year-old come into the school, and all they tell me, the only thing I ever wanted was safe and nurturing environment. That's all I really want. And by the time the child hits five, they want a lot more. Now they want to know that the child can tie their shoes and read. And then the child hits seven. And now they want to know they know their math facts. And, you know, and they can pass tests. And so the, the parents' implementation or, or um, you know, oper operationalizing their worldview changes over time. And the young parent doesn't realize that's going to happen. But the wise administrator will always be proactively knowing what the parent wants next. The parent's views about what they think they want for their child change depending on their developmental level. And don't let it fool you that this parent who was your best friend and loved the school and everything's wonderful in early childhood. And when it comes to, oh my God, I'm scared my child won't fit in or won't pass a test, that fear creeps up on parents. And sometimes if we're not aware of it, now they come to, oh, I loved you for this long time, but now we're ready to leave and go to this quote-unquote real school where the neighborhood kids go or my, you know, my work colleagues go so that I can make sure I get an end product because we're a little bit scary, right? We don't, we're about process. They don't know what our product is, but the, the, you know, rich private school down the street or the Catholic school down the street sells a product, and that's different. 
Absolutely. And almost any public school, unless you're in a really poor or dysfunctional public school district, they probably have much better facilities and much more equipment and resources. So lots and lots of parents will be sucked into the fact that there's a cafeteria or there's a school bus or mm -hmm. they have a computer lab or they have equipment that you don't have. You've really got to help parents to figure out what is it, what's the trade-off that they're getting by coming to your school? What's going to happen for their children? The other thing is what is going to happen is typically invisible until it's real. They can't exactly. see it. They don't see any evidence. And they're basically being asked to take it on faith. Mm -hmm. And we we believe it. We've sort of sucked in, but it's it's almost a religious fervor. And the typical parent does not hold things quite in that way. They may really like the place. They may have a lot of friends at the place. In fact, their friendships are the most likely thing to keep them connected to your school more than anything else. But Absolutely. unless you can find ways of giving them lots of evidence, they're going to drift away. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So we can't change people, but we can do something. And that is we can deliberately go out of our way when we're hiring a new staff member or when we're admitting a new family to not sell the school but rather to gather the right people together. Gathering the right people does not mean you sold them. I mean, you did in the sense that they don't just somehow discover what you have to offer out of thin air. You've got to help them be aware of it. You've got to tell your story in the best way you know how in as many different ways as you can, but you're not changing them. What you're doing is making them aware of what you're what you have to offer, and you're encouraging them to make a wise choice, and some of them are choosing you. And it's a lot like falling in love. You can't make it happen when, it's, when the spark isn't there. That concept, in my experience, is vital in understanding how to build a, a really great school. You do not simply sell Montessori. You do not simply talk about how Montessori works. You don't make idle promises. You don't simply talk about all the famous people who went to Montessori, because frankly, that isn't going to cut it. If these people believe in smacking their kids or paying them 100 bucks for a grade, and if they expect hours of homework a night, and if they expect to know how their child is, constantly in comparison with grade level expectations and the other kids in the class and they want their kids to be gifted and at the top of the class, they may not like your school very much. And the core is not that you should throw them out, but that you do need to ask yourself, is there anything you can do to that isn't going to have this story end in the same old way with them staying for a couple of years and then moving on and Maybe not bad mouthing your school, but not saying wonderful things about it and certainly not staying. And when they leave, they tend to take other people with them because when you have a small school and two or three kids in a friendship circle leave, you better believe the pressure on parents to leave, too, is enormous. And they will leave even though they're doing the basically say my children's friends are leaving and then they'll go and put them in a school that is not the same school as their friends quite often. So their kids have a brand new experience. It's even more of a change than they would have if they had stayed. But they leave because it's the easier thing to do. And sometimes they're just looking for an excuse to break up with you. Tim, I, I'd like to add just there that, you know, this gathering the right people and having them fall in love with us, and although that has to be done over and over again. It is not just an admissions responsibility. It's done repeatedly throughout the relationship that we have with people. That That's just an ongoing process, and, you know, and how do we do that? How do we continue to let them know what's coming up next and, and why they should continue to be in love with us and us with them, for that matter? Yes, I often use the description or the metaphor that it's like a marriage. 
-hmm. when you get married, that's the beginning of building the love and building the trust and building the friendship and the communication. You can't ever let up on that. And again, communication is very different from parent education. Yeah. Parent education in many people's minds is to essentially give propaganda to change their minds. And that's what I'm suggesting does not work. You can certainly challenge people's beliefs and give them information. And sometimes it works, but it doesn't work if their inner conversation is that what you're saying is garbage. If they think that you're a nice lady and or a nice guy and <laughs> you, you're very self-serving because, you know, if I stay there, you're going to pick up, I don't know, $10,000 a year from me. I'm going to tend to smile very nicely, but take what you're saying with a grain of salt and go it afterwards and go home to my, my spouse and say, yep, it was one more one of those evenings where they tried mm -hmm. to sell us on Montessori. I see that Sean Ross has made a comment. Can you see what it is, Kathy? You know what? I'm not able to see any, Tim. So, really? Oh, no, okay. I'm, I'm so sorry because I thought nobody's asking questions, but there's nothing showing up on my screen. Okay. And I've expanded well, into that. Cool. I'm not quite sure how I do this without having it all go crazy. All right. So, Sean, I can – I just – I threw the screen off of the uh, the PowerPoint off of the entire screen, and now I can read it. So Sean wrote a minute or two ago, seen versus unseen philosophy. Sean, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Would you like to speak live and explain it? I'm going to turn Sean live and give her an opportunity. Sean, you're about to go live. Turn off the uh, the barking dogs. Hi, Doctor. <laughs> hi, hi, Doctor. Hi. Ross. How hi. are you? Hi, Tim. Hi, Kathy. Hello. Hi, it's nice to see you. I, lo I love these conferences. Well, some the seen versus the unseen philosophy. It's let's say a politician builds a bridge in your town, and you can see that. What you don't see is where that where those resources could have gone that actually may help your community more and and sometimes that is i think what we see with montessori so much happens under the radar that comes out over time versus the bells and whistles that you might see at your local public school oh they've got the They've got the um, the advanced classes and oh all of this the big um, you know they've got a, a greenhouse or they've got the shop or um, the advanced placement classes. You, right. you, and we, and what we have is the don't see what happens hidden curriculum. <laughs> Sean, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes, we, that's the point. Mark, my son, Mark Selden, calls it the, uh, you know, the, the things that people cannot see. Um, by the way, uh, Devorah, I see that you said I can't see any comments. And what, what this is, is a screen that we can see as panelists, or I can see at least as the organizer. Um, but hopefully you all are seeing the screen. Um, and um, as as we saw with Dr. Ross, you, you hear why we usually have you on mute. It can sometimes create a feedback loop or if there are dogs barking in the background or whatever. So, Sean, thank you very much for clarifying what that's about. We'll return to uh, what we were doing. So it all begins at the beginning. And what I mean by that, it all begins with admissions. Building the right kind of school is all about the people you hire and the people you let in. And that that really begins with clarity. Clarity is the key to success, one of the most basic things that we say at the Monastery Foundation. Kathy, you've heard this for years. Uh, I think you first attended a foundation uh, course about 20 some years ago. Um, anything that you want to reflect on? Well, I think when I first heard that term, and it was, I, I remember very clearly, it was in 1993 when I came up to Washington and, and took the original leadership courses. 
And I, I remember thinking at the time, okay, I get that. It sounds like such a simple statement. And I'll tell you, for the past 21 years, I use that statement almost every day of my life. And it is much harder than it sounds because we have so many competing priorities. We have so many competing needs in the school and, and in this position. And so, you know, really finding clarity is, is much, I find it to be, you know, a, a top priority, but it's also, I think, a, a bit of a struggle with competing priorities, to be honest with you. I think that the every time I feel like, okay, I really get this, I am clear on this issue. There's just, it, it's like everything, all the doors open and things happen because there is the clarity. And people around you feel the energy of clarity. And it does make a huge difference. People will follow that. They understand what that is. But it is not, you know, personally, I'll just say it's just not been the easiest thing for me to get to. And it is um, something that's consistently on my mind. How do I get more clarity about this issue, this decision, or where, uh, where I can lead my school or my faculty, my parents, and my students? Absolutely. So once again, each of us runs our own individual Montessori school. Our schools can be very small. They can be in small towns. They can be a home child care center. They can be very large, very wealthy. There's no one answer. There is a Montessori legacy. Maria Montessori didn't copyright it. So if you choose to deviate from the legacy and recreate some aspects of Montessori in your own right, maybe weaving Reggio Emilio or Waldorf in with Montessori, or a more common thing is the elementary school that will put grades one and two together and grades three and four together and grades four and five and six together on the theory that three years is too much for a teacher to handle. Um, or they may start using textbooks and workbooks and whatever on the theory that you know, I just can't get really strong Montessori teachers. All of these are beliefs and decisions that schools make, and nobody does it to do any harm. But in general, it's true that if you want to get the results that Maria Montessori got that made her world famous, you're probably better off trying to faithfully and completely implement her model. That's one of the core beliefs. And if you do choose to modify it for whatever reason, I may not agree with you. Kathy might not agree with you. Nobody might agree with you. It really doesn't matter. It's your right. We certainly wish you would fully implement Montessori, but the bottom line is whatever it is you're doing, clarity is still the key to success. You've got to be very clear about what you're doing, why you're doing it, you got to gather around you parents who really value and appreciate that. And that, that Tim, really is the the um, the compass, if you will, that that clarity about monastery philosophy and implementation. That piece, as I said, I and I might muddle through priorities and other things, but when I come back to what works best for children through the lens of monastery philosophy and curriculum, it it is that, you know, that's the piece that always, when you come back to that and people can trust that you will always come back to that, that makes a big difference. Uh, Devorah is saying, by the way, it would be good if we had a back channel going at the same time for interactive comments and questions. It's kind of what Kathy and I were trying to do uh, this week, by the way, Devorah. We're not experts in uh, managing these kinds of webinars, so forgive us, we're, we're learning along the way. We had thought that Kathy would be able to be the monitor of the questions um, as a panelist and that I could focus on running the slideshow. As it turns out, whoever's sharing the screen, it blanks out what's happening on the comments and Kathy and the other panelists cannot see it. So we're still working out the, the kinks in this, but you're right. Um, mm -hmm. I believe you could probably have a back channel going on among yourselves because I think you can ask questions or there's a thing called chat at the bottom of your screen. I currently have it closed. I'll open it up. Um, 
Some of you probably can now see it. It may have may have appeared on your screen. Um, again, I'm not 100% sure that the things that I see as the uh, organizer of a webinar are visible on your screen. But thank you. I appreciate the uh, the thoughts and the questions. I see other things are stumming in. I see um, Sean Ross has said something about Kuzes and Posner wrote. I'm not sure, Sean, what they wrote, but let us know. Um, Carrie has written, it's a shame that some local laws are now prohibiting multi-age groups. Fargo, North Dakota is an example. The school we visited a few weeks ago has had to balance AMS and our state, and now for them, their city laws, and it is frustrating. Well, frankly, I believe, Carrie, that's a matter of politics. You, you don't have to sit back and take that. Uh, you want to form an advocacy group in uh, North Dakota, maybe North and South Dakota together. Um, AMS, AMI, and the Monastery Foundation and the International Monastery Council are working hard on those things, but it is all done by people like you at the state level. I assure you, there are case after case across America where laws that were intended to protect children in very different kinds of childcare programs that are meant to do no harm can really mess up monastery programs. All you have to do typically, instead of just taking it and being frustrated, is to reach out to that department at the state level, certainly also at the county level or the city level, because they're implemented by real nice people who mean well, develop friendships, explain to them why this doesn't work for you. See if you can't get them to voluntarily make an exemption for your school. There's absolutely no reason why that should not be possible. In the worst case, you may need to take it to the state level, which is a matter of gathering some state legislators who are willing to advocate for your cause. They may be able to solve it without introducing legislation, but rather by pushing back at the department level and saying, I've got a constituent who is very upset and this seems like an unreasonable interpretation of the law. Sometimes you have to literally work to get new laws passed in California, for example, I've done it. In um, in Arizona, there was a major effort led by Desert Garden Montessori School. Sheila uh, Chattel uh, Walters can be called out there to speak to about how they were able to get Montessori floor beds approved by the child care departments. I assure you, it is possible. You do not have to simply stand back and take it. Um, nor do you have to necessarily get adversarial. In a worst case, you can get adversarial. In Maryland, in 1963, we were up against a really adversarial State Department of Ed. We fought. We took it to court. Uh, we argued this was unreasonable interference with our freedom of speech, with our freedom of religion, and our freedom to operate businesses and to, to be free from unnecessary intrusion from the government. We won, uh, and as a result, ever since 1963, Maryland has had, in general, a very different relationship with Montessori schools specifically and independent schools in general, to the point where they're allowed to self-regulate as an industry. Uh, but we had to do it by winning on constitutional grounds, and that's a precedent you can use in other states. The bottom line is um, it is possible to advocate for authentic Montessori education. Sean has come back online. Kalsen Postner wrote the Leadership Challenge. She says that the number one practice is to clarify values. Jeremy Melt recently had to clarify just what GE is. Um, I assume you're talking about GE, the corporation. Thanks, Sean. Okay. Kathy, back to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So here we are. We've got this question. How can we best help prospective families conclude that Montessori is right for them and their children? How do we make that sales pitch? Well, I think that's a great question. Instead of how to convince people, which is where we started, how can we best help families decide, is this right for their children? First of all, 
I have a deep belief that it's right for all children. I do not believe it's right for all families and all parents, however. I think parents, because we can't change worldviews, and some parents have very different beliefs, it's not going to work for them. It's going to be disharm disharmonious in their family. It just won't work. So, But helping them uh, to come to the conclusion about Montessori being right for them has to do with us being having that clarity, number one, communicating the clarity, here's who we are, being honest about who we are and what we do, so that we're, first of all, not over-promising or telling parents we can do everything. We can't. We don't teach children to adjust to public school. We don't teach children to just follow directions and do what they're told. So, you know, it's important for us to be very clear and to communicate that so the parent can feel if there's an alignment between what we are offering, not what we are selling, what we are actually offering, and what they really want for their children. There's where we need the alignment. Mm -hmm. And some of the practical ways. So again, it all begins at the beginning. Clarity is the key to success. Can't say that too much. And we can work to gather the right people together. Again, circling back to those very, very basic ideas. So you can't change people. And I feel like this is going backwards. Huh. Yep. Yeah, I think it, 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 it is. It is going backwards. Folks, I am so <laughs> sorry. I've never seen it do that. Um, well, some I'm, things deserve to be repeated. You know, repetition is the key to learning, but we yeah, probably should try to move forward. Pro probably so. I've, I've never seen it do <laughs> that particular thing. So mm -hmm. one of the questions of this workshop is how can we refine the monastery message? And well, part of that is not where it's not just the Montessori message, right? It's the message of our individual and unique school. So we happen to be Montessori. That's our chosen educational framework. It's our chosen philosophy. Um, but we all have individual and unique offerings for our schools. And I think that's part of our clarity. I also think, you know, helping people understand what is Montessori and not being afraid of it is part of refining that message. Mm -hmm. And we have the um, the issue of the elevator speech, because quite often we do not have long. And somebody said to me, I, I this morning I had to get up and I had to do a five minute radio interview and then I had to do a 10 minute spot on a, on a TV station here where I am. Um, I can barely say my name in 10 minutes. I mean, how do you explain something <laughs> that we've given our lives to? So anyway, mm -hmm. I wanted to I want to take you. I'm going to click this hot link. And hopefully you're going to be able to hear this. Some of you have already seen it. But for better or worse, here it is. Can you adjust the volume up a little bit, Tim? Uh, I wasn't loud enough. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm adjusting my computer volume, but I'm still not hearing it as well as I could. Wow, Kathy, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It was just that the video was not, I could hear a little bit. Oh my goodness, how interesting. I would have thought that would have gone right through the system. Well, it just goes to show, it doesn't always work the way we expect. So let me uh, get off that screen and... Uh, but those are really um, very available for people to, to tune into on the YouTube channel, right, for the mm -hmm. elevator speeches. And they there's some wonderful ones and Whoa. It's a great idea even Hang to do Hang on, it's trying it again. Uh -oh. yeah. yeah, I'm trying to get <laughs> off of this. 
All right, now I think I'm back to control of my computer. I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. Yes, there's lots of good stuff that's available on YouTube. From the Monastery Foundations videos, they're all up there for free. Um, there's that wonderful uh, intro to building a pink tower. There are several speeches by Dr. Steve Hughes. I mean, there's just lots of good stuff. There's my talk up there about what children really get out of Montessori. That's not going to change anybody. And uh, I remember one year when I was really kind of getting hooked into the idea of sending out emails. I sent out an email a day to my parents with a different Montessori elevator speech or a different little two or three minute clip. And I got more complaints coming back from the parents saying, give it a break, Tim. I mean, <laughs> really? We don't need one a day. Um, so, again, you've got to you've got to be prepared to respond to the way your parents are hearing the message. You can't change people. Devorah, I hear you can't hear it. I'm so sorry. Um, all of that stuff, by the way, that you saw, that's just if you go into YouTube.com and you type in the word Montessori elevator speech, you'll you'll see about 100 recorded Montessori elevator speeches. That's from last year's national um, contest that Trevor Eisler and John Schneider and all of us in the Monastery Leadership Collaborative, AMS, AMI, Foundation, NAMTA, and so we all work together on that. And you'll see some that are more appealing to you than to others, and the, the secret is they're just a great resource. Um, again, we're beginning to learn what works and does not work with uh, GoToMeeting, and obviously if something is playing, it was blasting through my speakers. I could hear it in my earphones, but you didn't hear it. So there you go. Anyway, Carrie, you found the exact link for that one. I'll share that out with everybody. If I'm not sure if everyone got that. So I'll make sure that goes out to everyone. So that's the, that's a particular one I just shared. Anyway, elevator speeches. You're going to have to give them all the time. You're going to go to Rotary Club. You're going to go to Chamber of Commerce. You're going to be at the grocery store. People are going to ask you, well, what is this monastery thing you're, you're involved with? So how do, you, how do you convince parents? Well, you don't really convince them, but you got to have a way of boiling it down into very simple turn so that their eyes don't roll up in their heads and say, oh, my God, can I get away from this freak? So another thing you can do is have brochures. Now, you're looking there. Um, hopefully, you can see the latest Newgate school brochure. Um, Newgate is the Monastery Foundation's lab school. Uh, while we're at by Kathy, is someone talking in the background where you are? Yeah. If you could just ask them to, to whisper. No talking. Uh, yes. Yeah. I might have to walk away for a sec. I'll be right back. Sure. I'm just going to bring this up in the screen so you get a flavor of it. If anybody um, wants this, I can send out the link to it. Um, this is about a 20-page brochure, maybe a little bit more than what you would do. I'll show it to you as a two-page view. So as you can see, it's meant to be a fairly impressive takeaway. A lot of information in there. This kind of document, which, by the way, if you go to Newgate.edu, which is the Newgate School's website, this thing is right there. Um, you can you can link to it anytime. Just go under admissions, and you'll see a link to the brochure. So we have these, of course, printed. We have them online. They're meant to give people a fresh perspective as to what the school is. So I'm a great believer in the value of a powerful brochure. Now, obviously not every school can afford it, although frankly, these things are not that expensive. If you've got a good gift for writing, if you've got access to really great photos of your school, I don't think this costs more than a couple of thousand dollars to print up a few thousand. Um, and when you remember that the least expensive Montessori school that's private is probably costing $6,000, you know, 
Newgate, it's about $11,000 to $15,000, depending on the age. Uh, in some of the uh, larger cities, it's about $22,000 to $30,000. My goodness, uh, spending a couple of bucks on a brochure to make a powerful impression when a serious candidate visits. And by the way, I'm not suggesting you just leave these casually around your community and just waste them. But something that people can take away quite often is exactly what they need to become convinced that, you know, their instincts are right. They're heading in the right direction. This is a school that's really worth looking at more and more closely. Again, hopefully you're getting images very hard to do a brochure that will cover from toddlers to the 12th grade. But I do think it's a, it's important. Um, I think for there was a trend a while ago about go, you know everybody going digital and putting CDs in and and um, just driving everyone for the, to the website, which are all important things. But there's something about taking something tangible in your hand back home that reminds them of what they experienced when they were at the school, or that in uh, that encourages them to keep even stop by and see the school. I agree, it's not a giveaway at the local booth. Um, at, the, at the community of event, but for serious people, they are used to walking into uh, the Lexus dealership and the Mercedes dealership and walking out with something of value that reminds them of their experience. And I think that they're, you know, that that movement into digital uh, for a while, some of us got away from the printed materials. And I'm very much a proponent and agree with Tim on the, you know, a little bit of investment goes a long way as long as it's high quality photos and, um, of course, have somebody proof your writing. <laughs> I would say, by the way, a printed brochure is more valuable than a video. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, you're, some of you are seeing me do this. I am getting the link that people are asking me to share. So I'll, I'm about to send that out to everybody. So if you're online and you're seeing this, um, I'll make this large enough that it's recorded, but I'm sending it to all. And I'm going to enlarge my screen so you can read it, I hope. Hopefully you can see that. now. you can't see it that easily. Um, what it is is ISU, www.issuu.com forward slash Tim Selden forward slash docs, D-O-C-S, forward slash new underline gate underline brochure and that'll take you right to an online version that you can download of that brochure all right moving on let me uh, start the slideshow again i see a few people are having to go and that's fine again i will we are recording we will share this with you later in case you want to come back to it another question thing you can do is advertising um Advertising, this is a half-page ad that we run. We generally try to have an ad running in one or the other major publication in our little community of Sarasota every month. I really believe that marketing is incredibly important. Not everyone can afford it. I assure you Newgate is anything but a wealthy school. We scrape by to do it, but not doing it is like killing yourself. It's, you're, you're cutting off your food supply. Without advertising, a terrible thing happens. Nothing. And you've mm -hmm. got to advertise. Now, whether you use Google ads or whether you use Yelp or whether you use radio, whether you use TV, it really doesn't matter. Whether it's free av free things you can do by going out and getting yourself invited to be on radio or TV on a live show like I did today, it really doesn't matter. The point is marketing takes – there's an investment. Either it's money or it's time. Both are worth doing. And having clarity about your message. For example, what I hope you're seeing on this screen is something that doesn't look like children. It's just – it's a Japanese Zen garden, uh, and it says Newgate International Montessori School, because education is a journey, not a race. Of all the messages we've been giving out, that's the one that we've noticed in our town that has the biggest impact, that gets the most attention. Your message may be very different. The secret is to find a message that 
works for you and makes the phone ring. So what tangible things can you do to help parents to get the message, to appreciate the value of staying with Montessori? I'll just very quickly scroll through them and then Kathy and I'll kibitz, um, chat a little bit afterwards. The first is monthly class and community meetings. I cannot tell you how strongly I urge you to do that. Many people do not do it because they can't get their teachers to come out at night, because they're exhausted after a long day themselves as heads of schools, uh, because they don't have the perfect environment in which to gather everyone, or because they're afraid that they'll hold these meetings and only the same five parents will show up. Community meetings are not meant to reach every single parent, although every single parent and if you look at this picture, you'll see many students. They're all invited to be there. These meetings are actually run by children, and that would make a whole interesting webinar in its own right as to how do you run these meetings. The purpose of these meetings is to be a place that people can count on. They know every month at a certain day, at a certain time, they can show up, and if they've got a uh, suggestion, if they've got a concern, if they've got a question, they know that they can show up and they'll be able to see people who are other parents, who are students, who are administrators in the school, and hopefully some of the teachers, and that their voice will be heard and it will be shared with the rest of the school. I can give you a lot more information about monthly community and classroom meetings. They are the single most important tool that we know for building the kind of community you want. So even though we don't have time to go into how to make them happen today, remember that concept, class and community meetings. They are vital to building a relationship where you, when people gather, it is not a gripe session or a let's attack the head of school, but rather a place where people gather together and have thoughtful, graceful, polite, meaningful, and inspiring conversation. They'll sell each other on the value of the school. Um, tomorrow's child. If you do not give your children, your, your children's parents tomorrow's child, all I can tell you is I've been out there for 22 years trying to help. That magazine is offered way below our cost. We subsidize it. We strongly encourage you to use it. It's not a one tool will solve every problem you've ever faced, but there is nothing else out there like it. It's a, it's a tangible printed document that gives an unpredictable line of stories. And that's the beauty of it. It cannot be predicted. You don't know if they're going to talk about babies or the home or high schools or a school in Hong Kong. You don't know, except that in a typical 40-page issue, there will be about 10, 15 stories and if only one story catches one parent and they stay for one year longer, it was worth it. So I strongly urge you to support Tomorrow's Child. It's worth the investment. Parenting classes. You probably do this. Think... Hold, Go hold ahead, Kath. Go ahead, Kath. Oh, Tim, sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say about Tomorrow's Child, the thing that, you know, we, we use it and we've used it for many years. And it ebbs and flows as far as, you know, our parents reading it. It's a value added. It's exceptionally important. And what I found is if I've read it first and, extend, you know, call attention to somebody, oh, call attention to my toddler parents, for instance, and say, hey, this is an article this month that you might really want to look at. Um, and, it, and here's what we do at our school that, that you know, is complementary to what this is about. Or here's what we were talking about at this last community meeting. Maybe you'd like to read the article on adolescent programs or so I think that there's a certain um, level that you can even get more value out of that magazine by connecting our parents to something important in there just wanted to add that absolutely thanks Kathy mm -hmm. um, parenting classes you want to get parents to bond into your school and appreciate Montessori help them to figure out how to not want to tear their kid their kids hairs out um, you know, to really feel like they can make a Montessori inspired home. That's a great way to bond with your parents. So it's interesting. Those... A lot of parents will ask us, you know, well, how do you know, we try these, we say this at home and, and they don't listen to us. Why are they listening to you? And, and a lot of it, 
you know, we are trained to use particular language, positive framing, giving children choices, setting very clear limits. We almost take it for granted that children are going to, um, you know, be in relationship with us and, and do what we ask, and, and parents are frustrated. So having some things that help give parents the tools um, to, to be successful and to try some of the language or some of the strategies that we have in our bag of tricks, it, you know, empowers our parents and, again, again, more alignment with, you know, instead of, oh, well, you just, they do get to do whatever they want, they, you never tell them no. No, we just say it in a more positive way so we don't get as many battles. So there's lots of the ways that we can help parents, uh, you know, it, it let them into the secret of our magic, so to speak. Yeah, big ways to help. Parent talks. I mean, in my own my own hometown, I can't be the one giving the talk because, frankly, after about a month of being in our school, parents just assume that you're trying to sell them something. So I bring in people like Kathy. I bring in people like Steve Hughes, Paul Epstein. I'm off right now in Saskatoon doing the same role for the Maria Montessori School up here. The bottom line is these kinds of talks done typically three, four times a year can make a difference. No one thing will do it all. But the synergy of doing several of these things will tend to affect next year's enrollment. And people's talking positively about your school. It isn't just whether they stay. It's whether they're telling all their friends, whether or not they figured out how to explain Montessori, because they're asked about it at work and by their mother-in-law and so forth. They're asked about it all the time. So the more you're able to help them to think about how do I explain this to somebody else, the more likely you are that they will see it for themselves, they'll appreciate what is going on already, and they'll begin to become your allies and supporters and help you make things happen for your school. This is the way school was when I was a kid. Maybe you remember those days. Most of you are probably way too young. But the bottom line, even the schools that we have today are designed for this. They're very deliberately designed to create children who would go into the corporate world or go into the factory, the workplace, and do what they're told. Follow instructions. Don't think for themselves. The elite always sent their kids to private schools, or they always found public schools that were not like other public schools, elite public schools. New York City of Science and the Arts, for example, would be an example. Um, the bottom line is we have to help parents to understand the value of the investment they're making. This particular visual on the screen, for example, this comes from Heckman, who got the Nobel uh, Laureate Prize for Economics back, uh, I think, in 2007, showing that countries that invest in early childhood education not only produce kinder children, smarter children, children who tend to stay out of trouble, they tend to actually be much more productive for the rest of their lives. The first six years of life, as you and I know, are the most important. Here's another one of those images that may be helpful to you. This is a graph by Bruce Perry showing that in the first year of life, over here, I guess my cursor isn't going to move, you're not going to see it, but in year one to three, you'll notice that the brain is absorbing most of what it's going to absorb, the most of its ability to change, be influenced positively happens in the first year of life. It continues at a pretty high level up through about age six. By age six, it drops off. By the time kids are in middle school and high school, kids don't change. The bottom line is when children are young and we make the investment in them in those years, we are changing them forever. And that is the reason why Montessori is so exciting. Now, if we could get that across, it's easier to make the original sale. There still are plenty of parents. And I, I have a current family that I know very well that said, you know, my I love Montessori. I'll be back at age three, but I want my one and two-year-old to 
throw mud pies and uh, basically play all day. And she doesn't need all the structure of Montessori. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. These parents are not stupid. They're making decisions based on their perception of what's real and what's right. But what we can do is we can try to give people the hard facts. We can realize that some of them will listen and some of them will not. And we try to gather around as people who are fundamentally with us. And by the way, that same parent who's going to take their child and have them do play school for a year or two will almost certainly be back at age three. And it's okay. Their child will be okay. Um, all we can do is help them to try to understand why we do what we do, why it's so valuable. There are, of course, many famous people who went through Montessori or who are really huge advocates of Montessori. Adele Diamond, for example, is not really an outright advocate for Montessori, if you've ever listened to her keynotes, but her research absolutely affirms Montessori, and she admits it. Um, she's just not a specific, she's not pushing Montessori. Dan Pink absolutely in line with us. Steve Hughes is out of the box going around the world telling people how strongly he supports Montessori, as is someone like Ken Robinson and so forth. The bottom line is we can certainly point to Montessori success stories. We can speak to Montessori, uh, friends of Montessori around the world who are coming out of the closet. And we can use humor. Humor is not a bad thing. I mean, are you got your kids in a monastery school or a monastery school? Um, hopefully you can all see that. This is Clark Kent going to monastery school back in Smallville. And he's got a car and the teacher is saying, that's great. Now put it back where you found it, Clark. Um, and another picture. Um, oh, I thought you said that your child was going to a monastery. And of course, he's dressed up as if he's a monk or a friar from a monastery. And many of us have that experience of people thinking it's a religious school because it sounds like monastery. We, almost all, every school should or does do student demonstration night where the kids invite the parents and they're the teachers and they show them how to do it. That's one of the many basic tricks of how to get parents to uh, kind of get it. And of course, we can have events. This is a picture of a scene from Newgate School's annual opera, which is a major bragging right uh, for Newgate. And by the way, if you ever wanna look more carefully into that, that's run by a famous Montessori educator by the name of Sanford Jones, uh, who lives in Savannah, Georgia, and his wife, Judith Jones. They run Youth Opera International, and they can help you to create opera in your school. It is one of the biggest bragging rights that we have, and it's something I highly, highly recommend. And of course, lastly, whether you go through high school or not, gather your families together for ceremony. In our school, every child gets up on stage and graduates, moves forward one year, every year. Gathering all the parents, and I don't mean my toddlers or my three and four year olds, but certainly my fives and my elementary students and my middle stu school students, and my high school students, getting them up on stage and having all those parents there, again, tends to bond the parents more deeply to your school. So for me, the long and the short of the message is Montessori is not going to appeal to everybody for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons they're going to leave is not because you aren't good enough, but because you're frankly not worth it enough. They're looking at the cost versus free, and it's really tough to fight free. So unless you're running a charter Montessori school, you have the challenge of convincing people to stay, which means you've got to be that much better. You have to work that much harder. Also, those of you who are running charter Montessori schools, you know it's hard for you too, even though money's not the issue. Parents tend to leave charter Montessori schools for traditional charter and public schools for a lot of reasons. So it isn't just money. It's that people don't want to take a risk. 
People worry about whether Montessori will prepare their children for the real world. People are drawn to things that we may not put emphasis on, like a football team or a vast library or a cafeteria. You know, people are fickle. What you got to do is find people that love you for what you are. Kathy, I invite you to have the last word. Well, thank you, Tim. I, um, you know, it's always a wonderful experience for me to participate because um, it gives me a chance to remember why we do what we do and how important it is to share that passion with our families. And so, you know, not getting lost in the day-to-day -day, um, of all the many things that we're required to do, to remember to stay in touch with the passion of why we do what we do, and to make sure that other people experience that and are part of it because passion is contagious. 